Welcome everybody to week two, day three. Uh, we're going to start off with a quick review of the homework assignment that was due today. And then uh, we will move on to more on if statements. So let me show you first of all how to check your grades if you type Alpine. Uh, this is um, an email program just on the server. You can message index and you can find the email from today and it will tell you what your score is on the homework assignment. Uh, or you could wait a little bit and uh, it'll appear on Canvas whenever I uh, get around to copying it all over. They were all graded at noon today. So if you did not get a 5 out of 5 and you thought you should get a 5 out of 5, uh, let me know because a lot of times, especially on the first homework assignment, people do uh, strange things like they will, like I had one student do the homework assignment inside of, inside of Hello World, instead of Algebra, where it's supposed to be. Um, for your next homework assignment, it's going to be in Simple Calculator. Simple Calculator is uh, what will be due next Friday at noon. And uh, it is basically um, using if statements and algebra. So you're going to ask the user, do you want to do addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division? You're then going to read into numbers and then either do addition or subtraction or multiplication. That's it. Pretty easy. Pretty straightforward. And there is extra credit available. There's X credit for vetting your input. That's something we're gonna be talking about a lot today. So I just kind of want to show you that it's useful, not just in real life, but also in your homework. So you will get extra credit for vetting your, your, your input. And uh, there's also X credit for adding modulus as well. So pick up those points. Uh, the actual um, main.cc is just good luck. Have fun. So you're gonna have to write it from scratch, but the README file tells you everything you need to know, and all of that is found in your simple calculator directory. So uh, yeah, let's look at algebra real fast. CD algebra. And basically, the way um, this homework assignment was structured is really designed to kind of like hold your hand through the assignment. Each of the comments tells you exactly what you need to type here. Uh, not exactly, but it tells you what you need to type, like fill in the missing magic, so, you know, include and using namespace, and write the following code in main, and <clears throat> one uh, mistake I saw a lot of people make was they did this, like they wrote main, and then everything was like below it, um, which won't work. Then print this, okay, you print it, create a double, initialize it to zero, okay. you initialize it to 0, 0, you could initialize it to 0 dot or 0, it's all the same. Uh, read from CN into X. Um, now he he added this in here, and you weren't expected to do this for the homework assignment. This is actually the topic for today. So what happens if you try typing something that's not a number when it's expecting a number? Okay. What happens is it'll normally fail, and it fails in a very um, fails in a very specific way. So if integer x, y, z, and we see in the x and y and z, and see out x and y and z, no spaces, no end lines, whatever, we're, we're doing this. No initialization, I'm just trying to show you how failure works. So if I type in three and four and five, it prints out three, four, five, right? I type in three, now it's waiting, right? It's waiting for me to type in four, right? And if I type in four and hit return, it's gonna wait for me to type five, right? Now, what if I type in three squirrel? Watch what happens. It does not ask me to type in five. You see that? Once it fails, every input after that point fails. If I type in squirrel as my first one, all of them fail. It has three uninitialized variables here. Well, that's zero, and then two uninitialized variables. Okay, so the way that failure works, if you try typing in a squirrel when it's expecting an integer, it fails. It sets the fail bit, and then all subsequent CNs fail as well, and it doesn't even ask you. Like, it doesn't It doesn't pause. It just goes failure, 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 and it just cascades these failures all the way down. Okay. The way that you check for a failure on input is this, if not CN. Okay. Or you can say if not cn, or you can say if cn.fail. Either way, it's the exact same code. So if the fail bit is set, 
Fourth and field bit is set, exact same code. See and failed. See out um, user type and a non manager. I'm liking the colors, Mick Riley. Um, I'm liking your color scheme here. I like the blue a lot better than the garish uh, purple. Could you, are you using Commander of Conquer on that? Um, like, can you send me your, your CFC config file? Me? Yeah. Are you using, yeah, I can send it. Are you using Commander of Conquer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I like your color scheme a lot better than mine. Mine is like this, like, blinding, like, fuchsia kind of color. Okay. So, yeah. There, I, I, I don't know. So, there is a function called exit. Yeah, thank you, Micro. So, there's a function called exit. So, last time we talked about functions for, like, absolute value and sign and stuff like that. Here's a function called exit, and it quits uh, out, of, out of your program. And the, the number that you pass to it is the error code returned to the operating system. And if you return zero, that means no error occurred. If you return, uh, so not like that, it's a problem here. There we go. Okay. Um, if, you, if you return zero, that means there's no error. If you return one, that means an error occurred. Uh, what does the operating system do with that? Absolutely nothing. So legitimately doesn't matter what you do here. Um, I would say an error occurred, so I'm going to return one, but it, it literally makes a difference. It's just the error code returned to the operating system. Okay. So this is how you check for squirrels in your input. Okay. So if I compile the code again and run it, three works fine, four, five, three, four, five, everything succeeded, everything's cool, three, squirrel. Okay. And you see that it, the next one, it doesn't wait for me to type Z. It just fails. It cascade, like all the failures cascade through all of those things. And then we check for an error. And it's like, yes, there was an error. The user typed in a non integer. So this is something that you really ought to get into the habit of doing. Um, checking for, checking for errors anytime you do input is. I would argue mandatory. A lot of people consider it optional. But like what you saw was like if we didn't if we didn't have this error checking here, right? Or slash star comments out a block of code, star slash ends the block comment. Um, when we when we didn't have this error checking here, right? Um, if I type in three and squirrel, you see we got like some really bizarre results here because we got an uninitialized variable. Like you, it, it's just. Are you? Do you have it open right now? Make really. Okay. So yeah, I would argue this is like mandatory. Anytime you ever read anything from the user, always, always, always error check it. Um, even if it's just you writing a program for yourself. Like, let me let me show you my source code for um, collecting the homework. Like, I just ran this code back at noon. It's a, a shell script I wrote called Collect Homework. And it's got tons of documentation so that, you know, I don't expect myself to remember how to do things. Tons of documentation on it. And then there's all sorts of error checking that I do. Does this program exist? If so, do this. If you're not running it as root, note to the user, it has to be run as root. If you didn't pass in enough command line parameters, then tell the user how to use it. Um, okay, they typed in a class name. All right, let's delete out everything in the class name that isn't a digit, a lowercase, or an underscore. And if that did, in fact, delete anything, then the class name is invalid. So if I were to try to collect the homework, sudo collect homework, Right now, I'm collecting it from like CSI 40. Like, let's say I, I had like some special characters in here. Then uh, uh, it is not, uh, let's see, what special characters are allowed? Um, no, it's a two, uppercase. It is not going to, it is not going to allow. Okay. Um, uh, sure. Class name is invalid, right? And so, all like, I'm the only person who ever runs this code. You know what I mean? I'm the only person that ever runs it. And yet I am 
incredibly paranoid that I'm going to type in, you know, um, some name here that isn't, uh, you know, I, I make sure the class name doesn't have any invalid characters in it. I make sure the homework doesn't have any invalid characters in it. And I do that because, like in Unix, if you have like a dollar sign inside of the name, the dollar sign, you can actually embed variables inside of other words and it could cause all sorts of chaos. So I do this to keep myself, which this runs as root, has maximum permissions on the Unix file system. Error checking and vetting are the same thing, yeah. Uh, this thing runs as root. And so if, if I typed in something wrong, I could feasibly wipe the entire file system on the, on the computer, on the entire server. And so, you know, there's a lot of programmers out there just like, well, don't make a mistake then. Just don't make a mistake. Just type it in right the first time, every time. Oh, Lord. <laughs> and that's how they get hacked. You know, that's how they get hacked. They're like, well, just, you know, you know, don't, don't make a mistake. Um, I think I showed you this before, like Wikipedia, they do uh, like donations and things like that. Uh, they, uh, they vet their input. Wikipedia. They vet their input for the donations using JavaScript, right? And so, uh, let's see, here's some question. And they're not doing the donation thing right now. Um, do donations, no? Okay. There we go. Okay, so over here, uh, they have enter your own amount for donations. And if I try typing in negative to donate a negative amount of money, they actually have a JavaScript program running on my local web browser here that prevents me from donating negative dollars. Now, the funny thing is, like, a couple of years ago, I, like, opened up the, uh, um, uh, the the tools and actually disabled that script and removed the line of code preventing me from typing a negative number. And then I could type in negative 100 and then go to donate, and it would happily accept it. <laughs> and uh, that's a problem with them, right? You should not trust that the person sending you an amount of dollar bills is going to be on, you know, on your side. Uh, they should have had a line of code that said, if the donation amount is less than zero, throw an error. That's all they had to do. Instead, what they did was they just told the person, you know, tell the hacker's web browser, like, please don't type a minus. <laughs> you know, just please don't. Please don't allow a minus, you know, to be typed. Right? And, uh, and it's just really funny because, like, look, I just pasted it in. Oh, they're checking for it now. Please select an amount minimum when you start. Good job, Wikipedia. Let's see if this. Yeah, it's not going to allow it now. Good. I've, I've been hammering them on this point for a while. And maybe they saw the video and added a check. But yeah, before they, they very happily accepted my donation of negative, negative $100. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's just like. And that's a case where you're working with real money. And, and, and with just random people on the internet, there should be zero trust, negative trust, you know, for any of that stuff. But look, like this is all me to me and I still don't trust myself, right? Uh, does, uh, does the reference directory not exist? Then, you know, make a note of that, quit the run. You know, does the reference app application exist? If it's not found, then I print an error message. If the homework directory doesn't exist, like, all these things are all checks for myself. And for some of them, like, you know, it checks to see if it's executable. You know, if my copy of the executable, if I don't have it set executable, it'll detect that and throw an error message. And um, and if the if this directory doesn't exist, then it, then it makes one, right? If this directory doesn't exist, then it makes one. Like, there's a huge amount of error checking and handling. It's like page after page after page for a script that only I run for myself. And I know how it runs. Now, multiply that by an order of magnitude if you're ever working with the public, okay? And uh, it, it's just hilarious to me how many websites just are like, well, I just trust the hacker not to turn off, you know, JavaScript or paste the number in like I did right there. Having the client system running a security check is like a gate standing in the middle of an open field. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. So, yeah, the, the idea that that has any form of security at all is, is hilarious. Okay. So, 
that is that is our topic for today. We're going to be talking more about if statements. So, what a So what I would like for you all to do is I want you to um, I'll, I'll just do it. double x y z c n x y z if not c n Show you one more thing when, when we're on this topic. So what happens if you type in like five? That's fine. What if you type in three point three? So that's actually not an error for y because three is an integer. So so this is trying to read into y, right? And so this is going to read in three and then stop because dot is not a valid integer. And then it's then when z tries to read in dot three dot is not a valid integer it's going to throw an error. Okay. But if we did this with like five and four and three point three, you'll see that it actually worked. But there's a dot three left behind in the input buffer. This is this is kind of a subtle bug that maybe makes sense for some of you, maybe it doesn't. Um, so. Yeah, basically when C++ is reading from the input buffer, it reads as much as it can, and then if there's ever a space or a dot or something like that, it stops. And so if we have these be doubles, well, doubles can have dots in them, right? So 5.5, 4.4, 3.3, it's all, it's all good. All right, that makes sense? And like, let's say this is like um, age. Okay, so let's say that we're reading age in from the user. So one age that's not valid would be squirrel or pizza or something like that, right? What other ages are valid? Yeah, we're, once we get past this point, we know age is a number, right? So once we've gone past this this part here, we know we know that age is a number. But what what numbers should we accept? What numbers should we reject? Between one and one hundred fifty, somebody could be zero, right? Easily. All right, a newborn baby is zero, right? They're not a year old yet, they're zero. 0 0.1, right? Zero to 130, okay. So if age is less than zero, let's see how that age. If age is over 130, see how that age and quit. Now this this part here kind of makes me feel bad, okay? Because one of the things that computer scientists never want to do is repeat themselves. I'll say that again. The one thing that computer scientists never want to do is repeat yourselves. There's something called the dry principle. Dry stands for do not repeat yourself. Don't if you're going to be technical about it. Okay, so I don't. I kind of feel bad, right? Because I've copied and pasted this code. You know, there's got to be a better way of saying something like, if the age is less than zero or the age is over 130, print bad age. And as it turns out, you can actually do that. So this is our topic for today. So if age is less than zero or age is greater than 130, print out bad age and call it a day. Okay. That is perfectly valid C++ code. You might see people write it like this as well. 
So a uh, double vertical slash means or, uh, or you just write at right it is or. So uh, yeah, there's or and 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 not, and that's kind of our topic for today. So let me switch to. Uh, does this make sense to y'all? So like I was able to combine those two if statements into one. And we're gonna I'm gonna pull up a PowerPoint presentation, and dig into it, but I just kind of want to show you in source code. How it works. Okay. All right. So let me pull up the presentation for today and we're going to go through conditionals. Okay. So we'll just take it from the top. If just a very simple if statement. So uh, this is going to be audience participation. I'm going to want all of you guys watching the presentation here and then writing on the screen what the answer is going to be. So if the user here types in 5 for x, what is it going to print to the screen? I'm going to count to 10. Have all your answers in by then. Okay. So if uh, the user types in 5 for x, what is it going to print to the screen? And answers now. Good. We have 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Students responding. All right. So now we get to find out which students are idling this class. Okay. Hmm. Who did not respond? Hmm. Call them out. Did Noah respond? Noah Etheridge Smith, are you there? I don't know. You are, okay. I, I, wanna, I want responses from everybody. All right. All right. Moving on. Is this code going to print out yippee or woohoo? Int x equals 10. If x is less than 10, print out yippee, else print out woohoo. Answers now on Discord. And the answer is woohoo, not yippee. 10 is not less than 10, right? This is not less than or equal to, this is less than. So uh, when you evaluate an if statement like this, you take it a line at a time. So you say, is 10 less than 10? No. So you skip over the yippee block here and you hop down to the else statement and print out woohoo. Okay. Now, this is something new. This is the if else if. So um, this code will print a if x is zero. And if a is not, if x is not zero, then it moves on to the else if. It says is x seven. If it is, it'll print b. If it's not, it just moves on without doing anything. So everybody on Discord, please print what this will print to the screen. Nothing. Okay. Prints nothing to the screen. Uh, because it, it goes one line at a time. Is 12 equal to 0? Nope. Skip. Is x is 12 equal to 7? Nope. Skip. Doesn't print anything. You don't have to print out something if you don't want to. So by using if, else if, and else, you can kind of cover every possible situation uh, that you can, you can think of. Okay. Outputs nothing. All right. So here is another example. And remember, you have to evaluate this one at a time. Like the biggest mistake that students make when doing these things is that they, they just kind of look at some random line and be like, okay, yeah, 10 is less than 20. So it's going to print out X is less than 20. You know, they just kind of, no. These things are evaluated top to bottom. Okay. So look at the first one. Is X less than 10? If it's not, skip. Go to if X is less than 10, skip. Else go to X is less than 20. Okay. So yeah, this will print out, uh, you do x is less than 20, good. All right, so let's do zero now. So x is now zero, 
On your marks, get set, go. Okay. All right. So, is zero less than zero for the first line here? No. So it skips the x is less than zero part. Is zero less than 10? Yes. So it prints out x is less than 10. And then it doesn't do the second part. A lot of people will think it'll print this, but it doesn't because there's that else there. The else, the else only triggers if this thing is false. Okay, and it's not. This is true. So once you get a true thing, you skip all the other else if, else if, else if, else if, else if kinds of things. Um, if you want to see how far down that rabbit hole you can go, let me see if I can find some source code here for you. Um, I, I have seen... Um, if else if else if else if else if code run on for a long time. Pull up VS code here. Look at the source code to Quake. Or is the game code for Quake, not the server code? It's on QC. And let's see here. Super. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you see all those if this is this, if this, else if, 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 I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling. Yeah, it's like 3515. So it's like 260 lines long. And that's just one of the examples of that. So it's 260 lines of if, else if, else if, else if, else if, else if, kinds of things. Yay, it's readable. <laughs> I don't re I don't really recommend writing code that way. It works. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's take a look at this one. Int x is equal to zero. If x is less than seven, see out a. Else if x is equal to zero. And uh, again, two equals in comparisons, right? So when I read this in English, I will say if x double equals zero. And the reason why I do that is because I've trained myself over the years when writing if statements, even when I'm mentally writing something, I'll tell myself if x double equals zero. Uh, because if you mentally tell yourself if x equals zero, you're going to write if x single equals zero. And that's going to set x to zero, which is not what you want. So just train yourself to think of this as double equals. This is comparison. This is very different from a single equal sign. A single equal sign sets the variable to zero. A double equals compares it to zero. They're two very, very different things. And so because they have two different things, I give them two different names. And that helps me keep it keep it straight in my head. Okay, so here we go. So int x equals zero, if x is less than zero, c out a, else if x double equals zero, c out b, else c out c. And 10. And nice, you guys did a lot better than the 12 o'clock class. A lot of them said it would print out b. Because you just sort of look at it, you're like, oh, look, well, zero, zero. Yeah. Nope. Mm -mm. It will not do B because uh, this is going to happen first. Whenever you evaluate an if statement, you have to take it from the top to the bottom, right? Is zero less than seven? Yep. So it prints out A and it skips the rest. All right. So a lot of people in the 12 o'clock class are like B. Nope. I mean, because you can't do that. You can't just like jump halfway through it. Top. Top to bottom. That's how the code goes. Triggered. <laughs> okay, so that puts it. Skip to the Okay, there we go. So, uh, some students were asking me about the curly braces. Um, so, let me show you um, something about curly braces. Because this is something a lot of students that in the previous lab were in trouble with. So, like, let's say you're writing this if statement. What they would do is they would... Um, Kind of write this line first, and then this line, then this line, and then finish up with the close bracket, close brace. But they would kind of lose track of where they were, so they'd kind of like be here, and then they'd say like else if you know age is equal to twenty one, and then open bracket, and then they'll, this actually is really bad. This actually won't compile because this ill, this else isn't actually following anything because. It's inside of this if statement, right? You need you need to have your curly brace there for that to make any sort of sense whatsoever. 
And so what I recommend when you're writing an if statement is to do this. If x is, I don't know, equal to 21, watch this. Open curly brace, close curly brace, and then I go up a line, and then I'm going to hit O. O stands for open, and it opens the line below it. So it's like when you make a hamburger, you put the top bun down, you put the bottom bun down, and then you work on the fillings. If you follow this process, you're much, much less likely to make mistakes where you just, like, especially if these things are like, I don't know, you're like, you know, like 40 lines in, like, at, at this point, you're not even going to remember that you need a, a closed curly brace in there, you know what I mean? Like, where am I? I don't even know anymore, you know? So always start off by doing the if statement, open curly brace, close curly brace, and then do the middle, okay? Um, the exception for that is if you have a single line of code. So if you have one line of code like that, uh, the curly braces are technically optional. That is perfectly valid code. So we've got age instead, so it shuts up. This is perfectly valid code. If you have one line of code and one line of code only, then the curly braces are optional. And some people put it like that. Some will do it like that. Most computer science professors will recommend that you do the open and close curly braces like that. Um, I'm somewhat inclined along those lines until at least you get your your uh, firm firm footing under your feet. Um, but then again, like a lot of students, like in the previous class, did this. And then they would do, you know, at age equal to 60. And they kept doing like open curly braces and not closing them. <laughs> and then their code wouldn't compile. And and then, you know, the compiler would be like all oh, like I'm missing a closed curly brace, you know, expected a closed curly brace. And they're like, well, I don't know what, where to put it. So I'm just gonna throw them all at the end of the <laughs> No, don't do that. Don't do that at all. It's terrible. And uh like no, this is really bad. You know, I just need, need a couple extras. <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. You know. um, one trick is GG equals capital G. So GG, like good game, equals capital G. This is a Vim command that reformats your code. And so GG equals capital G. And what you'll see there is the indentation there, like goes bloop, like that. And that's a sign to you. That's a mental sign. Uh, I forgot to do a closed curly brace. Um, if you reformat your code and your your coded indentation, all the formatting gets like screwed up. That um, that is a sign you forgot a closed curly brace. And so like I would come in here and be like, oh yeah, I forgot that one. Do that, and then gg equals capital G, and then bloop, that comes back over. And oh look, I'm still I don't have a curly brace at the end. And then everything is right with the universe. So this is the command to reformat your code. Very useful thing. Uh, there is also a command line uh, shell script that I wrote called reformat. And uh, reformat will reformat your code as well. So if you, I don't know, a lot of students code looked like this. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what happened. But like a lot of students were like coding like this. Yeah, don't, don't, don't. Mm. <laughs> so uh, yeah, GG equals capital G. Whoop, all the formatting gets fixed. Okay. Don't don't be the person that uh, has all of your formatting screwed up. Mm -mm. No, don't, no, don't. Uh, G equals capital G. Just go with the default formatting. Trust me. Okay. All right, coming back over here. So, yeah. Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, this is also important. So, So you can you will see people do this a lot. Um, you can use an integer like it's a boolean. Zero is false. Everything else is true. If age see out.
So if I type in zero, age is false. If I type in 11, age is true. If I type in negative 11, age is true. 42, age is true. 420, age is true. Negative 900, age is true. The only value for which an integer or a number is false is zero. This is a short, uh, it's a shorthand for that, basically. So zero is false, everything else is true. Okay. Why would you use an actual Boolean when ints are so much better at doing a Boolean's job? Uh, well, sometimes you only want to allow two values. Right? So, um, you know, if, if the type that you need is Boolean, use a Boolean. If you need an integer, use an integer. So yeah, if age is true, if the value here is anything but zero. So this one will only happen if age is zero. So zero is false, zero is false, everything else is true. This is a very important thing in computer science, in C++ at least. Zero is false. A lot of people think one is true and one is true, but two is true also and three is true also. So in, in Boolean arithmetic, zero is false, one is true. But if you're using integers, negative one is true, five is true, everything not zero. Everything non-zero is true for these kinds of things. You understand? It's like 100 is true, 20 is true. All right, so what kinds of things can you put into an if statement. Less than, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, double equals. Remember I call it double equals. I don't call it equals. Double equals, right? Equal to, it's double equals. Comparison. Don't call it equals, it'll confuse you. Um, and then not equals. So the bang character, the exclamation mark, means not in computer science. So if you've ever taken a logic class or if you've taken a philosophy or something like that, um, you might have seen not written like this as like a little gun looking thing. Uh, that means not X. Or you might have seen it written as like a tilde. I write it as that. So all of these just mean not X. Um, in C++, we write it this way. And the reason why we do this instead of using the finger gun or the tilde and things like that is because it's on the keyboard. <laughs> so um, there is no uh, uh, negation, philosophical, logical negation character on our keyboard, so we don't use it. We use exclamation mark instead, the bang character. Okay, and so this means not equal to 42. So, we're tr so this whole thing will be true if x is not equal to 42. Okay. Now, this is the learning point for today. This is what you're expected to come away from today with. In addition to an appreciation for vetting, which is very, very important, so you don't get the hacks, right? This, okay. Every time you get input, you should check it, make sure it's valid. Make sure the, the, the values are in a range that makes sense. Make sure they didn't type in squirrel. You don't want squirrels stuck in your input buffer, okay? Um, this is the other thing. So this is how you make complex if statements. So you might have seen earlier, I had on here, if the age is less than zero or the age is over 130, okay? Right there, or. Okay. What other things are there? There's and and there's not. Okay, these are the three logical operators that matter. There's also something called XOR that we're not gonna pay attention to right now. Uh, these are the three things that matter, okay? And, and, or, and not, and there's two different ways you can draw and. This is perfectly valid. Nope, nope, it's gonna erase, isn't it? Nope, it, it erased. There we go. So you can write and either with double ampersand or by actually writing out and. And it's always funny watching students try and draw an ampersand if they're not familiar with playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I used to call students up to the whiteboard and they would kind of go this way and end up like that. 
drift off. <laughs> uh, or can be written either using vertical slashes or by using or. Okay, these are both the same thing. So if I were to come over to my source code here and change the or to two vertical slashes, that code is exactly the same. So two vertical slashes means or, two ampersands means and, or you can just use the English for it. Two equals means equals, and students have asked me, is there a word version of double equals? Yes, there is. Uh, I don't remember what it is off the top of my hand. But when would you use and? Okay. Um, let's find an example for and. So let's say that um, there's a student discount, right? So if the student's age is greater than 10, and the student age is less than 19, I'll say less than equal to 18, then see how it student discount applies. That makes sense? So if their age is greater than 10 and less than 18, so that creates a range of values. Um, Say greater than or equal to 10, just to make it symmetrical. So if they're 10 years old, 11 years old, 12 years old, all the way up to 18, they get a student discount. If they're too young, they don't get it. If they're too old, they don't get it. All right. So if we change this to an or, let's think about this for a second. So if you're in your 40s, you're older than 10, right? So your student discount would apply. Because or, this whole thing here is true if either side is true. That's what or means, right? If I'm either over 10 or under 18, I get a student discount. Well, I'm over 10, so I get a student discount, right? And what if somebody's two years old? What well, if they're a baby? They get a student discount because they're under 18. What if you're 100? You get a student discount because you're over 10, right? If you're either over 10, or under 18, which every possible number is, you get a student discount. You get a student discount, and you get a student discount, and you get a student discount. Everyone gets a student discount, which is probably not what you want, okay? And the way that and works is both sides have to be true. So it must be the case that they are older than 10, 10 and up, and under 18, 18 and under. So both of those must be true for an and statement. For an or, one or the other or both must be true, okay? So in this case, and is the correct thing. And some students have trouble with that, and so we're gonna go through some examples, okay? Brace these things here, and let's do this. So, x7, y is 12. Is it true that both x is less than 10 and y is greater than 10? What do you think? Everybody, audience participation. Cast your votes now. Operators are standing by. Is it true that x is less than 7 and both, both of these have to be true to print a? Y is greater than 10. Yep, so it's going to print a. Okay. What if, what if y is 10 now? So x is 7, y is 10. Which one of these is it going to print? A, B, or C. Yep. It will be B. It'll be uh, B because 7 is less than 10 and 12, or sorry, 10 is less than 20. So this one um, is true, but this one is false, right? So both of these are not true, so it does not print A. Moving on to the next one. 7 is less than 10, good. Uh, 10 is less than 20, good. So it's going to print B. All right. What about if X is 10 and Y is 10? What's that going to print? C, right? Because uh, 10 is not less than 10, 10 is not less than 10. So both of these are false, so that's going to be false, that's going to be false, so it's going to be C. All right, let's move on. Welcome to Wells Fargo, the off-brand version of Wells Fargo. Okay, so you're supposed to enter your age and income. Let's say you're walking to the bank. 
the kiosk there and you have to enter your age, you have to enter your annual income. Okay, so we made a couple of variables, age and income, and then uh, in, in reality, this would be coming from like a touch screen or something, but let's just say it's CN and the user inputs their age and income. The first thing we check for is what? What is the first thing we're checking for when they enter their age and their income right here? What is what kind of what kind of input is this going to protect us against? Not a number, yeah. So if they type in squirrel, it'll prevent it. Now, and normally you would do something like print out, like uh, you know you got to type in a number, uh, but yeah, it's not going to fit on this PowerPoint slide, so we're just quitting. In reality, you would handle it. Like people would be very upset at you if the kiosk suddenly just like quit if you typed in squirrel. Okay. So now we're going to say if age is less than zero or age is over 130. So we're making sure that the age is in a valid range, right? So if either the age is less than zero or the age is over 130, we're going to print to the screen, error, bad age, entered, and quit. Moving on to here, if age is greater than or equal to 21 and our income is over 100,000, see out personal banker. And this is something that I didn't know existed until I started working in tech and started actually making reasonably good money. Not like Elon Musk money, but reasonably good money. You know, like programmers get paid a lot, right? And so, uh, you know, I went to Wells Fargo and they like had a personal banker come up to me and, and like take me aside. And they were like, hey, is there anything I can do for you here at Wells Fargo? And I was like, yes, there is. I would like for you to never charge me fees ever again for any reason. And they were like, okay, I'll make a note of that in your account. And every so often, you know, Wells Fargo like updates their system and I start getting like monthly fees on my checking account and stuff like that. And I just walk in there, I'm like, look at my account file, look at the note. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. And they like clear out all the fees for me. I never have to pay fees or anything. It's really nice. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So that would only apply. Like, so if my age was ten, uh, that wouldn't work because the this line of code here is only if you're over twenty one, twenty one and up, and you're making good money. Okay, then it's going to send you to a personal bank. Now, persuasion one hundred. I know. Like, they're just like, hey, what can I do for? You? I'm like, oh, well, let me just. Let me just see. Let me just see if they'll do it for me. And they're like, "Yeah, we can do that. Sure, of course." <laughs> That's cool, neat. And uh, like I said, every time they they try putting fees back on, I'm just like, mm, "Look at the note on my account." Oh, I'm so sorry, sir. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, yeah. So for this one, if it is not true that your age is over 15, 15 and up or you're making over a million a year, then the manager, him or herself, will come out and talk to you. So this, this part here looks a little bit awkward. So how would, I, how would I rephrase that? Right now it's saying, if the age is not over 15, 15 and up, how could I rewrite this so it's a little bit simpler? The left, heart, the left half here. Right now it's saying, if my age is not over 15, how could I, how could I rewrite that? using C++ code with less, less typing. Not if age is less than or equal to 15. Remember, 15 is included in this. So it has to be, yeah, Messick, very good. So if I were writing this for real, I'd write if age is less than 15, right? Not less than or equal to 15, if age is less than 15, right? Because 15 right now is included in this thing. So the opposite, the opposite of greater than or equal to is less than. Okay. Good. So if either you have a kid come in, you know, like a two-year-old walks into the bank, then it's going to call the manager, right? Or if, you know, Elon Musk comes in with his income over a million a year, then it'll also, you know, call for the manager to come out and see you. Now, here's a question for you. What if you have a five-year-old come in that makes $2 million a year? Would it call for a manager, yes or no? Yeah. 
Yeah, of like some child star boss baby type person coming in. And the answer is yes, it would. Because with ors, one or the other, or both, in this case it would be both, must be true for the or to be true. So if we have somebody who's 10 or 5 or whatever, and they're making 2 million a year, the left side's true, the right side's true, therefore the whole thing is true, and it will call for a manager. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So let me show you something called a truth table. This might help as well. Okay, there we go. So this is and. So you might notice that is, yeah, yeah. No. In computer science, we use double ampersand or you just type out and. So for and, an and expression is true only when the left side and the right side are both true. For any other combination of false, if there's any falseness in there at all, it's false. So for logical disjunction, which is or, if either of them or both are true, if either of them or both are true, then it's true. The only way an or is false is if both are false. And then for not, true becomes false, false becomes true. And you got the little philosophical finger guns there. And it's super annoying like to use because like, you know, you're writing your thesis or something and like, you don't have a key cap for that, you know? So you have to like go onto Wikipedia and like select that, copy it, you know, come back in here, paste it. Or so, okay. Okay, so here is a new type of variable, Boolean. Okay, so Boolean is uh, like an integer, but it can only hold two values. It can hold true, it will false. And uh, sometimes people will write it like this. Oops. We'll do one for true and zero for false, but I don't recommend it. You'll see that, but I don't Just write true. Write true, write false. All right. I don't know if that's coming through, but there's something happening out there. Okay, okay so uh, we're creating a variable named x of type bool. Again, bools can only hold true or false. Those are the only two values you can hold. Uh, so we copy the value of y into x, so x is now false. Um, x is equal to not y, x is now true. Boolean z is equal to x is equal to not y, so that's true, that's true, true, double equals true is true. So this is gonna set z to be true. So let's do some examples here, okay? So, we've got x, y, and z. x is true, y is false, z is true, okay? If both x and z are true, then it's gonna print x and z are true. Does it print this, yes or no? You don't have to type the whole thing out, just yes or no. Is it gonna print x and z are true to the screen? Yes. Indeed, because x and y are, in fact, both true. What about x and y? X, x and z are both true. Is it true that both x and y are true? Is it gonna print x and y are true? All right, because y is false. So in order for an and to be true, both of them have to be true. And in this case, the y is false, so it does not print anything in that case. It doesn't. What about x anded with not y? Is it true that both x is true and y is false? Are both of those statements true? x is true, y is false. Yep, okay. So we'll, it will in fact print x is true and y is false. 
Uh, where, where does it only print if true, though? Because uh, the way these things work, whenever you have an if statement, it, it evaluates everything between the smooth parentheses. And so this whole thing here is a Boolean expression. It's something that evaluates to true or to false. So when you come in here, it'll evaluate this. X ended with Y. That's true. That's false. True ended with false is false. So if you have an if false, nothing happens. There's no else. If there was an else, it would do something. But there's no else. So it just doesn't print. This whole line gets skipped right here. It's going to print this line. It's going to print this line. But that line there is just going to get skipped. Okay. So, yeah, if you want to... <laughs> some people comment out their code this way. Right? Like the, they're at like, uh, if false. Like I've literally seen people comment code this way. Uh, or instead of zero, you can write false. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> but, you know, I've seen it. I don't like it, though. <laughs> Like there's something about this that just kind of sets my teeth on edge. And, uh, you know, <laughs> could you do if true? Yeah, you, know, you could. Let's see how, why did I bother writing the if statement at all? Because this line of code is always going to run. Yep. You understand? This is kind of like bad. It's kind of like bad code, you know. Like don't, don't do this. But it's at least educational. Do you understand? Like this code will always run. These two lines will always run, and this line of code will never run because if false, it just skips, just skips over everything between the curly braces here, from here to here, just skips it, and then it moves on down here. Okay. Yeah, it's cool with that. You don't have to like it, but do you understand it? Like the logic of it. So I, I, if I deleted this if statement here, it would just be the same. If false equals true. <laughs> yeah, be careful with that, Martinez. Because you said if false equals true. And you used one equal sign instead of two. So you're trying to change the value of false to be true. And, and that's going to bust a hole in the space-time continuum. Because you're setting zero to be one. <laughs> and all falses from now on out will become true. Um, no, you can't do this in C++. False is not a value you can change. In Fortran, in Fortran, this would work. You can actually change, like in, in Fortran, you could do this. Five is equal to 42. And that would permanently change the value of five to be 42. And if you ever Printed out five after that in Fortran, this would print 42. <laughs> this is horrible. This is like Cthulhu level mathematics. Like, we're going to set the value of five to be 42. We're changing the value of these platonic, these platonic forms. <laughs> Is that coming through on this, the microphone? Okay. Sorry about that. We got construction going on right now. So yeah, don't you can't do this. You can't do this. Don't even try. It that would also be if false, right? So this is the same thing as if false, right? And you're just gonna like if this ever goes to code review, like this is not going to pass code review. Like, they're just going to look at you. And they're just going to shake their heads like, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. 
So yeah, don't don't try and break space and time by setting false equal to true. I think that was actually in Rick and Morty, right? Like I think in Rick and Morty, like um, he breaks into like the central bank, right? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like uh, Rick. Set. He like sets the value of a dollar to be zero or something like that. Uh, I'm probably gonna get a copyright strike. Here, let me stop recording for a second. All right, so yeah, they change the value. Of Mr. President, the Blenflark's value just the Blenflark's value just dropped to nothing. What do you mean? <laughs> so don't do that in real life. Okay, Metalocalypse did that. Oh, did they really? Interesting. I, I've watched every Metalocalypse episode, but I don't follow them. It's cool. All right. I hope that doesn't get me copyright struck. It might. I don't know. We'll see. It was like a half second of Rick and Morty. So we'll see. All right. Let me come back. Um, I live dangerously. All right, so what about this one? Is it true that either X or Y or both are true? Stream ended? Ooh, okay, all right, all right. Uh, let's try this, all right. How about now? Do you guys see it now? All right, we got 24 people here. All right. <laughs> if you put the trash into the trash, it's fine. <laughs> I like that. Trash in a trash. <laughs> nice. Okay. Is it true that either X or Y are true? Or both? Yep. Yep. What about... Uh, I'll add one. Add one. Okay. Is it true that either X is true or both Y and Z are true? So you can you can make these things as complicated as you want. In CSI 26, we go into more details on like how to kind of manage the complexity of really complicated if statements. I've seen if statements that have had like 50 different clauses inside of them, and it gets mm, really hard to debug. I don't recommend it. But like here, you know, we're saying either X is true or both Y and Z are true. So is it going to print, welcome to the Thunderdome, yes or no? Yes. Good. Because even though this part here is false, right? Y ended with Z. This part here is false, right? Because Y is false. Right? So it's not the case that both of them are true. So that, that right-hand side here is false. But X is true. True or with false is true. So this whole thing evaluates to true. And it prints out, welcome to the Thunderdome. All right, so some more examples here. X is 42, Y is false. Okay, is it true that X is less than 10? Yes or no? Is it true that X is less than 10? Yes or no? No, okay. Next line. Now remember this is that, that thing that I was showing you. Zero is false. Right, so not x means x is zero. So this is a uh, very shorthand way of writing if x is equal to zero. So is x equal to zero? What do you think? Negative zero. No, it's not, so it skips that one too. Okay, it does not print x is zero. Uh, Java doesn't allow this, by the way. In Java, you actually have to write out x double equals zero. It kind of irritates me because I actually like shorthand like that, but they're like, oh, it's too confusing for a Java program. So they kind of dumped on their own people, I guess. So uh, is it true that X is equal to 42, double equal to 42, and Y is true? Is that true? Okay. Both X is equal to 42 and Y is true. Mm. Nope, that's not true either. So remember, we evaluate these things by just going down one at a time, one at a time, until we find one that hits. Is it true that x divided by 2 is 21? Or y is true? Is this true? That either x divided by 2 is 21 or y is true? Good, you guys are all getting this really well. Well done. Uh, yeah, so that is true. So it's going to print out x. Oh. Uh, 
Oh, that's why I built it. That's fine. Uh, there's not enough room on the slide. Just make the text field bigger. And of course, it's got smart quotes. Uh, stupid smart quotes. Stupid smart quotes. No, no. If you ever come try copying and pasting this, it won't work because PowerPoint puts smart quotes in for everything. And smart quotes are not C legal. Fix these. Matt, what the hell? Really, PowerPoint? Backwards double quote? Really? Okay. Uh, and that needed a semicolon there, too, I think. Oh, that was there before now. There. There. That needs a semicolon. Oh, really? Okay. And there. Okay. Now it's better. Cool. So, yeah, never try copying and pasting code from PowerPoint because probably the, the, the smart quotes are going to not be the straight up and down quotes, but the curved ones. And C is like, I don't know what that means. Compiler error. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, this looks pretty good. Okay. So it is now going to be lab time for the remainder of class. What I would like for you to do is labbing time. Let's do this. Lab time. And I would like for you to do the following. Do the following. Things. Make three doubles named X, Y, and Z. Cn and do the three doubles. Check for squirrel or other non number inputs. Die. Uh, cool. And then Check, um, uh, okay, uh, so these are going to be the three sides of a triangle, okay? Further vet the input to see if their values make sense. If they don't, put an error. And I'm not going to tell you exactly what values should be allowed or not allowed for the side lengths of a triangle. I want you to think about it. Okay. So remember, the user can just type whatever they want on the keyboard. They can put their face down on the screen and roll it left and right. In your code, your responsibility is to not have it crash and to handle it properly no matter what. Okay. So think about what kinds of values make sense for the sides of a triangle. Squirrel, I'm giving to you, is not allowed. Okay, we don't take three three squirrels as a uh, as a side length. Okay, and then uh, print out if the sides of a triangle represent a valid triangle or not. For example, a one 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 hundred triangle can't exist. Okay. You can't, like, the, the other, the two legs of the triangle are so small, they actually, like, if you have one of the tri triangle sides, it's, like, length 100, and you got, like, two little dopey, like, one inch long legs at the end of it, they can't connect. Okay. So it's your job to tell me if the three numbers typed in are a valid possible triangle or not. You don't have to categorize this as a right triangle, an equilateral, and I you don't have to do that categorization. That's coming. That's going to be a homework assignment. So make sure you do the lab time because it'll help you. This is like half of your uh, homework assignment for like next week. All right. Just make sure you do the lab time so you can practice on that. And uh, yeah, all, all you have to do is say, yes, that's a valid triangle or no, that's not a valid triangle. Okay. Y'all understand? Can you do this? Do you know all the skills? If you get stuck, you gotta ask for help. I can't see your computer right now. Okay. When I'm in the in-person session, I can walk around and see when somebody's stuck and 
you know, they forgot a semicolon or something. I can't do that when we have an online class. It's up to you to screenshot what you have on your screen, post it on the help center. And then myself or Mincarelli will, you know, or, or one of you, like if one of you sees what the problem is, you know, help your, help your fellow human, you know, so you can do it. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to probably stop the recording here and we'll do lab time for the rest of class. Uh, reminders, your Zybooks week two is due to start class noon on Tuesday, on Wednesday, rather. So, and that's twice as long as the current one. So don't wait to the last minute. I was getting, I was getting messages this morning on the Zybooks and it's like, <laughs> start earlier. Like, like I've said this many times, the only way you can fail this class is if you wait to the last minute and you get stuck. And, and a lot of students just aren't used to the feeling of getting stuck and not knowing how to do something, you have to give yourself enough time that if you get stuck, you have time to get help and get unstuck. Okay. So don't like everything should be done the day before it's due. I'm just telling you this and, and people are like, ha yeah. I, I can show you the grades on the Zybooks week one. If you want to, if you don't, if you don't believe me. Yeah. So, uh, Right, so lab time rest of the day. Uh, Zybooks week two is due on Wednesday. And then Simple Calculator, your next homework assignment, is due at noon on Friday next week. And that is it for today. So we've learned more complicated if statements, uh, ands, ors, nots, um, Boolean variables. That's the big learning point for today. Yep, everything's due at noon. I, I don't ever have anything due at midnight, usually, unless I forget to click AM instead of PM. <laughs> Everything's due at noon because that's the start of class. I don't. I don't like. I don't like having uh, homework assignments due after class starts because then people will spend their time during class working on the homework that was due that day, and it's just it's not conducive. Everything needs to be done by the start of class, and then we can move on to something new. And um, yeah, that's that's the reason why. But. All right, peace out, everyone, and I will hang out. And you got the rest of class, like I said, to uh, to work on this lab. I want, to, I want to see everybody. I want to see everybody post their solution for this prior to like dipping out of the channel. Like we've got twenty seven people online right now watching this. I don't want to see you guys like, oh, it's lab time, quit. I don't see that. I want to see you do it. All right, peace.